listen to the 2022 College of Medicine annual meeting. We have a number of items to review today, uh, beginning with uh, the presentation of the graduating class 2022 by Mike Witt, who is Associate Dean for Medical Education. Take it away, Mike. Very good, thank you, Bert. So it's my pleasure to uh, share with you the class of 2022. And I'll share with you some statistics and also provide the names. So we have 174 graduating students that will be graduating for the academic year of 2021-2022. Five of those students graduated this past December. We have two students um, that have a deferred graduation. One uh, will graduate in July with an MD OMFS. So this is our joint oral maxifacial surgery program. And then one student who will receive their degree posthumously. So the average GPA for this class was slightly higher than in the past with, with a 3.57. There were 14 students who had a perfect 4.0 and uh, 10 students matriculated with an earlier class. Um, so one received a master's in journalism from Columbia, two uh, had to recycle their first year, and then seven took leaves of absences for various reasons. So for USMLE licensing exams, this is the first class that I'm aware of in College of Medicine history to have 100% first time pass rate for step one. So <laughs> tremendous. Uh, also the, this is um, certainly above the national average. The score also was slightly above the national average. Uh, for step two CK, they had a 99% first time pass rate and the average score was a 245. So this is a, a tremendously successful class. So um, again, uh, we have a number of students, some of these numbers won't quite match. So we have 166, so 96% of the class have residency positions currently. Three of the students have, uh, are doing post-graduation uh, research years. So as far as uh, kind of uh, distribution, 43% of the class or 71 students are doing the residency in Tennessee. And um, the majority of those are actually gonna be in the UT system. 44 will be in Memphis, seven in Chattanooga, six in Knoxville and seven in Nashville. So this table uh, just shows uh, the general distribution. So we have 53% of the class that's going to be doing primary care, which is again, meeting the needs of the state of Tennessee and kind of our uh, aspirational goals for the College of Medicine. 19% uh, are in surgical subspecialties. And then we've got the rest of the class in a variety of other uh, uh, residency positions. So this is the class of 2022. These are the names of those individuals. So please uh, take a look. I'd like for everyone to review this. Um, and again, acknowledge our one student who uh, unfortunately had passed away during his M4 year. So at this point, unless anyone has questions or comments, I will call for a vote. So for those of you in the, the auditorium here, if you would please raise your hand if you agree to certify this class for graduation. And I'm gonna have a few people count, so. Wonderful, any against, any abstaining? Wonderful, thank you. For those of you that are doing it remotely, hopefully you clicked on the QR code that will allow you to vote and we'll tally those votes uh, at, uh, after the meeting. So thank you all very much and congratulations to the class of 2022. Thank you, Mike. And thank you for all of your leadership in medical education 
in the College of Medicine. Now Javi Moriam, who's the longstanding uh, secretary of the Dean's Faculty Advisory Council, will uh, address three issues. The first will be the results of the changes to the College of Medicine bylaws that have been considered over the past year by the Dean's Faculty Advisory Council. Then she will discuss the, present the results of the DFAC uh, presidential election for the 2020 three term of office. And finally, she will uh, lead us in a brief survey uh, on faculty participation in surveys uh, conducted by the uh, Health Science Center. So please uh, welcome uh, Javi uh, Moriam, again, long-term secretary, has provided great service over many years to the Dean's Faculty Advisory Council. Thank you, Bert. Um, so as noted, we, uh, we have a couple of things to take care of. The first one is, uh, doubtless you received an email and hang on, something popped up that I didn't intend to pop up. Um, you received a, a, a vote opportunity for some changes to the College of Medicine bylaws, and this was unanimously approved. Uh, 114 votes, which is well beyond the quorum. Uh, and, and then apparently a couple more participants who just voted now. So we have that uh, well in hand. For the de facto president elect, uh, those of you who are familiar with the ballot are aware that there was one candidate, he won by a landslide. And so Dr. Thad Wilson will be the de facto president elect. Um, the other thing that we wanted to do, um, every year uh, we have various surveys that uh, faculty are invited to participate in, things like the upward evaluation where you are invited to evaluate your supervisors, the dean, the administration, other folks, and then this year there was another survey, the COACH, C-O-A-C-H-E survey, and we tend in the College of Medicine particularly to have very small turnout for this kind of thing. And every year we sort of bring our hands in fetch and say, oh my gosh, why do so few faculty, something like 16 or 17%, why do we have such small participation? And uh, so we decided to take uh, a small survey. And so we have it in two directions. This is what you will see, whether you're online, uh, and I'll give you in the chat, I have already put in a code, you just click on it if you're online from the chat, or I'll give you a QR code if you're in the house. But what we're gonna ask you is, did you fill out the coach survey? You often fill out the upward evaluation. Uh, and then if you answered no, if you tend not to fill these out, please check all the boxes that apply. Um, and so online attendees in the chat, you'll have this link. And so for the QR code, bring the camera app on your phone, focus it on the QR code, and here you go. Uh, we have a couple of hands that have been raised. Uh, so Dr. Uh, Francesca Fang Liao and Dr. Eubanks, if you have anything in particular to ask, we'd love to invite you to uh, raise those questions now. All righty, so if we uh, have got that QR code long enough, please uh, file your, your, uh, your answers and then I'll compile those. I will share the results in the chat because Bert, I'm gonna take that, uh, turn it back to you and stop screen sharing right now so that you can introduce Dean Strome. Bert, uh, I think we'll need you to unmute so that you can introduce Dean Strom. Thank you. I've lost my visual connection. Do I have an order? We can, I can see you fine. Okay, somehow or another, I've lost the connection on my screen. But anyway, let me introduce someone who needs no introduction, our uh, Dean, 
Scott Strom, we welcome you uh, to give your state of the college address for 2022. So welcome. It's really a privilege to be able to give the State of the College of Medicine address for 2022. And we're doing a mixed address with some folks on virtually, actually the majority of folks. We have, uh, I think, over 130 people on virtually as, as well as several folks in the audience. So really nice to see those of you who could make it in person, as well as those of you who are online you know, the College of Medicine is address is really a celebration. It's a celebration of all of the hard work and effort of everybody in the College of Medicine. And I'd like to start by saying thank you. I'm deeply appreciative to have such wonderful colleagues. I couldn't imagine uh, working with a better group of people. And I'm really privileged to serve as your dean. What we're gonna to cover today is several things. The first are global themes that impact the College of Medicine and everything we do. And the two that we've focused on are diversity, equity, and inclusion with a real focus on inclusion, and then promoting the careers of women in medicine. We're then gonna move on to clinical practice and really cover some of the key areas which affect who we are, where we are, and perhaps most importantly, where we're going. We're gonna to touch on research and education with education, particularly talk a little bit about the LCME. Uh, we've talked about that in a fair amount of detail as well as the ACGME in separate venues. And then we talk a lot about getting students in and then their matriculation. We focused a lot on what is happening in between and some of the great things that are going on within the college. We're gonna speak about community engagement and a deep gratitude to our board of visitors and then our research. And I'll preview that by saying that over the past five years, we've had a near doubling in our extramural research funding in the College of Medicine, really um, absolutely terrific. We live in a community and um, we can't do what we do without saying thank you to all of the people who allow us to do what we do. Um, the police officers who protect us and make sure that we are safe, uh, the janitorial staff who really keep the buildings looking so spectacularly um, clean and nice and allow us to do our work, and um, the administrative staff who allow us to do and accomplish our important work. So I wanna start by saying a great debt of gratitude to them. I also wanna thank our new communications manager in the College of Medicine, Erica Wynn. Erica was really terrific to work with in putting together this presentation. So a big debt of gratitude to you. I don't know if Dan Quayle said this or not, but I really like it. He said, I'd like to say a few words before I start talking. And if you don't know who Dan Quayle is, we attribute it to him. We're not sure it came from him, but it makes sense that he would have said it. And I'll leave it like that. I show this slide for three reasons. Um, the first is to demonstrate that we're a statewide institution. Um, Memphis is one of our campuses. We have campuses in Nashville, in Jackson, in Chattanooga, and in Knoxville. And we're deeply appreciative of all of the leaders on those campuses. I also want to recognize the promotions of several people within the dean's office. First, um, to Dr. Teresa Hartnett was promoted to senior associate Dean and is now our chief financial officer. So something really fantastic. So a round of applause for Teresa. I also wanna recognize um, 
Before we move on, uh, Dr. Polly Hoffman, who retired this year. Many of you know that Dr. Hoffman was the Senior Associate Dean for Faculty Affairs for many, many years. And she had a tremendous impact on the school and I really value and appreciate her contributions over the years. Moving forward, we have a lot of new faces in the Dean's office with uh, really great promise. So let me introduce you to them now. Dr. Mark Bugnitz has joined uh, the office of the GME and really is serving as a leader um, in program growth and improvement. We have two new assistant deans, uh, Dr. Nia Zalamea and Dr. Sarah Cross in the Office of Faculty Affairs, who are going to work directly with our students and improve their counseling. We've also been very fortunate to recruit Dr. Ryan Sheehy, who will serve as the assistant dean of the basic science curriculum. And then we won't say to replace Dr. Hoffman because she will... Um, forge her own course and is already um, serving her own course and making a wonderful reputation is Dr. Alicia Diaz-Thomas, who now serves as the Associate Dean of Faculty Affairs. So we welcome all of these new folks into the Dean's office. And as the Dean, we look forward to working with each and every one of you uh, to make your careers more, more, run more smoothly. I mentioned that we have two overriding themes. The first is diversity, equity, and inclusion with a real focus on inclusion. When I came, one of the first things that we did was recognize that we were lacking and that we did not have an associate dean of diversity, equity, and inclusion. And we were privileged that Dr. Claudette Shepard agreed to take up the mantle and serve in that role. Dr. Shepard's done an absolutely fantastic job, first, in bringing us together and wrecking the importance of diversity and equity and inclusion to our culture, and second, in beginning to make proactive change to make us better. Let me give you a couple of examples. Starting with the bottom, we were recently asked by the AAMC, our parent organization, to participate in what's called the DICE survey. That's diversity, inclusion, community, and equity. And under Dr. Shepard's leadership, we were one of the participating institutions that allows us to take a general survey of where we are with a goal of where we wanna go. What this will allow us to do is compare ourselves to national data, but the questions themselves are important because whether we get a yes or a no, it's simply a baseline that will propel us forward. Under Dr. Shepard's leadership, there's been two organizations which we've worked with, Project STAR, and you can see what that stands for, and Project RES, designed to empower medical students and residents to grow in their careers, particularly those who are underserved in medicine. She's also started a book club uh, for diversity, and this is a book club on anti-racism. You can see one of the books that has been read by the club. And I'm also very pleased to announce that we are supporting faculty in the Dean's office to get training in diversity, equity, and inclusion so that we can be better as a culture. So this coming year, we tend to have an action plan based on our learning for next steps as we seek out to become better. Diversity, equity, and inclusion doesn't only include our faculty and staff it includes our, our students. And you could imagine a scenario where we as a school wanna recruit students who may not have had all of the advantages of uh, different educations. And that's not only folks uh, who are underrepresented in medicine, but potentially folks in rural areas, folks who may not had all the educational um, benefits that you could get. And under the leadership of Dr. Dustin Fulton, uh, we created the LEAP program. And this was really his idea. LEAP stands for Learning Engagement for Aspiring Physicians. And this year, we partnered with Memphis Challenge, which is a, an organization in Memphis that predominantly serves 
um, um, the African American and Hispanic communities. What it does is it takes promising youth as judged by test scores, essays, et cetera, and invites them into a comprehensive program so they can be educated, not just during the year, but during the summers, et cetera. We partnered with that program this year and had a full day on the medical school campus uh, where these folks actually came in. They got lectures about how do you get into medical school? What is it like to be a doctor? What's it like to be a doctor of color? Um, what does debt look like? And then got to spend time in the simulation lab. Perhaps more importantly, we'll track these individuals moving forward so that we can begin to bring these folks into medicine from the very beginning and moving forward. So diversity, equity, inclusion, my hope is that it's gonna impact all aspects of our culture from pre-training to training to faculty to moving forward. In that same vein, we worked very hard to promote women in the College of Medicine. And I'd like to thank our credible leadership team under the direction of Dr. Teresa Hartnett, but so many talented um, female faculty and staff who have really pioneered this effort. You can read their names. I'm not gonna go through them individually, except to say thank you. So what has this group done? Last year, we did some foundation setting and this work showed us where we were and where we were is not where we wanna be. And if you look over to the right hand um, part of the slide, you see that at UTHSC, about 35% of our faculty um, were women. A lower percent that we want were full professors and an inadequate number were department chairs or leaders within our organization. Based on this, the team put in place an action plan, which is multifaceted. The first thing they did was they built a women's leadership network. And I was privileged to talk to that group, but many others were able to talk to that group. The idea is that their seminars specifically designed from female for female faculty who are engaged in leadership opportunities. And it allows them to hear, but also to caucus as a group, share common goals, common problems, common hurdles, and then ways to overcome those hurdles. We're also, as the Dean's Office, supporting um, folks to attend the AAMC meeting, looking at the advancement of women in medicine, thinking that national level training will benefit our individuals who can then bring that training back. And I'm proud to share some of the results. Um, this year, for the first time, and I'll show you this a little later, 50% of our class was women. Recording 50, in progress. 50% of our medical school class is female. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, for the first time in our history. That's a major achievement and something that we should celebrate. This match day, seven out of eight of the surgery residents are female. Think about that for a second. For those of you who have been in medicine a long time, I can tell you when I was matching, that would have been unimaginable. So kudos to Dr. Shibata and his team. About 60% of the faculty in pediatrics are female. We're making progress. We have a long way to go, but we're making progress and the mission is important and it matters. And I think it's incumbent upon all of us to drive this forward uh, because our female faculty and our female leaders are so important to who we are and to our culture. Moving on to clinical practice, we are by far the biggest medical school in the state of Tennessee. We have campuses and practices literally all over the state. And this graphic shows you just a snapshot of where some, but not all of those practices are. The faculty and staff are the lifeblood of our practices. And we've been incredibly fortunate to recruit great people. Um, I'd like to call them out individually. Dr. Richard Walker has assumed the department chair of ER medicine. Dr. Stuart Lazaroff 
has assumed the role of interim chair of the Department of Anesthesiology. Dr. Mansoor Parsi is now the chief of gastroenterology. And it's just a privilege to have someone so talented um, to be at Regional One Health. Thanks, Dr. Vern, for recruiting him. We're very fortunate to recruit Dr. John Chorgi as our chair of OBGYN. He's a luminary in the field of GYN oncology. He literally wrote the book on GYN oncology, and we're fortunate to bring him here to Memphis. When I asked him, why, why would you come to Memphis? And his answer really, uh, um, perhaps, not, uh, perhaps not surprisingly, but it surprised me. He said, because I've never seen a group that cared so much and so deeply about their patients. And that was the reason he came. What an answer. Dr. Um, Julio Lanfranco assumed our chair of pulmonology and critical care. Dr. Shelley Ost became our division chief of internal medicine. We're very pleased to recruit Dr. Deborah Becker from the University of Pittsburgh to be our division chief in the uh, department of surgery of plastic surgery. And then Dr. Matt Wilson has assumed the interim chair of ophthalmology with an ongoing chair search. So we're delighted to welcome these leaders and we're delighted that they are here. So where do we stand clinically? Um, first, we have a variety of clinical partners and I'd like to thank them all for their willingness and, and help in chaining all of our learners. As all of you know, we train the majority of physicians, approximately 40% in the state of Tennessee. And we do that year in, year out, rain or shine. And we require the help of all of our partners. So I'm not gonna call them out by name, but I do wanna say thank you and acknowledge their important contribution in training the workforce of the state of Tennessee. This gives you a snapshot of where we are. You can see the greatest number of faculty are really now at Regional One Health at our UT practice plan called University Clinical Health and at our children's hospital called Le Bonheur Children's Hospital. Um, we also have residents and fellows though across all of these hospitals. So they all play an important role in the training of our students and all of our learners. Let me highlight a couple specific areas of excellence, not to exclude anybody, but just simply to highlight some accomplishments over the past year. The first is we've spent a significant time over the past two years in growing uh, UTHSC Regional One Health as an academic medical center. And you may ask why, why would you do that? And the reason is for the following vision, which I'm gonna take the liberty of reading. Our vision is to provide world-class care, innovation and discovery that harnesses the power of the academic health system to advance health and wellness in the Mid-South and globally. That's the reason why. It's to build a collaborative enterprise that takes care of all patients, independent of their background, independent of their wealth, independent of anything except that they have a need for care. It's also a place where we can educate our students and provides a stable environment for education. It's a place where we can grow research and it's a nidus for interactions with our community. We've had several successes over at Regional One. On the right shows our new GI lab. Uh, where we recently uh, just purchased with the help of Region 1 endoscopic ultrasound equipment, which will allow us to diagnose and stage patients with gastrointestinal malignancies on the same day, so they don't have to go anywhere else. We've also purchased in collaboration with Region 1 a uh, new robotic system, and here is our chair of um, the Cancer Center, Dr. Jave Shibata, under the, under the robot, uh, performing a complex robotic procedure on a patient. But you can see just really beautiful rooms. When you look at cancer care, we literally started off with zero, zero cancer infusions over at Regional One per month. 
Now we're well over 100. That's pretty incredible. And then in order to facilitate the new cancer program, Regional One has built out two new floors in the route building so that patients have state-of-the-art care in state-of-the-art facilities. And I show you that on the right side. We've also established new and burgeoning partnerships with the VA. Um, the VA is a wonderful place for care, for training, and for collaboration. And under the leadership of so many of you, we've established a new partnership where we're dividing the program into clinical care, research, and education with a team leading each of those efforts. And the goal will be to meet quarterly with an oversight team to make sure we're advancing each of those missions with the VA. I truly believe going forward that the VA represents a lot of untapped opportunity for both parties um, as we seek to provide outstanding clinical care with them, education with them, and research with them. So when I look at the VA, I see the power of possibility. And I think with our new structure, we'll have the chance to realize that power. As we transition to research, I want to acknowledge our clinical where we ended up this year in US News and World Report. We were ranked as the number 26, and I'll repeat that, the number 26 finest medical school in primary care in the country. That's a big deal. That's something that we should all be incredibly proud of. Number 26, uh, you know, top 20%. That's pretty good. It's not top 10%, but it's pretty darn special and something that we should all take a tremendous amount of pride in. So kudos to all of our primary care providers, no matter what discipline of primary care you're in, this is what got us here and this is what will sustain us. We also moved up to being the number 68th medical school in research. You may say, well, that's not great, right? Middle of the pack. And you're right, it's not great yet. But when you look at the trajectory, which I'll show you next, you'll see we're moving in the right direction. So what do I mean? Over the past five years, our federal awards have almost doubled. Think about that. In a five-year period, our federal awards have almost doubled. There's a lot of credit to be given there. I really want to thank our basic science chairs who really deserve most of the credit. Under their leadership, um, so many departments have burgeoned, so many young investigators have grown. But I also want to thank several of our clinical chairs who are growing programs in their own right, in surgery, in medicine, in so many places, we're growing. And the idea will be to sustain this type of growth. We have to build those bridges between our basic science and our clinical departments. We have the leaders to do it. We have the people to do it. Now we just have to walk across the bridges that are being built. And I'll show you some of the exciting opportunities that are coming. So how do you get there? Well, you get there by awards and by people. And I want to call out six, um, just based on amount, but they're really emblematic of the awards that we got without uh, meaning in any way um, to... Um, I wanted you to try. To, oh, I see, if everybody could mute their mic, that would be great. Without... Um, uh, meaning in any way to say that these are better than anybody else's, just as a way to kind of highlight the achievements in the college. Dr. David Chibata, our chair of surgery, uh, is a participant in a $10 million grant for the International Study for Colorectal Cancer. Dr. Ken Ataga, one of the luminaries and world leaders in the study of sickle cell disease. Uh, received a $3.2 million grant looking at sickle cell disease and kidney disease. Dr. Yan Kui received a $1.7 million grant for innovating artificial intelligence. I also want to congratulate Dr. Karen Johnson and Dr. Kui Zhao, 
for a $3 million study to look at the interplay between weight loss, bone frailty, and diabetics. Dr. Eliza Makowski just got an outstanding grant looking at breast cancer genetics research. And Dr. David Astbrook received a $2.85 million grant for a project on aging and Alzheimer's disease. So you can see the breadth and depth of some of these tremendous projects here at UT that is facilitating this growth. I really want to highlight our first time awardees. I don't know, uh, many of you remember uh, how special it was to get that first grant, how great it felt. And usually a first grant that you get uh, speaks volume not only to the awardee, but to their mentors. So thanks to both of you. And, and we really have uh, some incredible first time grant awardees, Dr. Rima Zhao, Dr. Brendan Tunstall, and Dr. Jeremiah Holt who's an MD PhD student and received one of the first awards of its kind under the mentorship of Dr. Neil Hayes. This year was also an exciting year in terms of our CTSA application. The CTSA has been applied for, for gosh, I don't know how many years at this institution, um, but a lot. And Karen Johnson and, um, Michelle uh, took over the leadership of this grant. And for the first time, we received a highly competitive score of 28. We don't know if we're gonna be funded yet, but we're on the right track. And we've never had a super competitive score before. So this means that we're really pushing the envelope. A CTSA really is a recognition. It's a status symbol for institutions. So this grant is important to us in this regard. The College of Medicine has invested significantly in this grant, both financially and the leaders of the grant are all College of Medicine. So I wanna say thank you to the entire team. I think sometimes we get a little bit lost and we focus on grants, but we forget to focus on the results of the grant. Uh, so I wanted to highlight a few key publications. Um, so uh, you can read them here. I wanted to highlight one in particular by one of our new investigators, our chancellor, uh, who published a paper in Nature as part of a consortium looking at the genetics of, um, the genetics of schizophrenia. I actually read it. It was, uh, um, really a neat, neat way of looking at schizophrenia and hopefully we'll make some advances in a disease that's been so tough to characterize for so, so many years. But congratulations to Chancellor Buckley. I also wanna highlight uh, Dr. John Beesler uh, and Dr. A.J. Talati and, and Nico uh, Pivnik in our pediatrics program for their fine work. These publications are really across the College of Medicine and they're in journals that are some of the finest, not just Nature, but New England Journal of Medicine, JAMA, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and you can read um, what Dr. Marquita Nelsa and Dr. Darshan Gandhi are doing when they're incredible work. I would be remiss as a head and neck surgeon if I didn't call out my colleagues uh, for their work in squamous cell carcinoma um, because that's just what we do. So I had to, I had to put that in there, but uh, congratulations to all of those physicians. So we've talked a little bit about how we got there, but how do we begin to sustain growth and how do we move forward? So what we've focused on in the Dean's office is building platform technologies. The 100,000 Genome Project was really born out of the idea of John McCullers, to begin collecting tissue samples in about the year 2016. And under the incredible leadership of the team showed below, we were able to translate those data into sequencing in partnership with Regeneron. Based on the fact that we have these data and sequencing data, we were recently invited to join what's called the Genomics Information Commons. That's a group of some of the finest pediatric hospitals in the country. You may know some of them, Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, Children's Hospital of Boston, uh, some like that. And the most famous 
uh, La Bomber Children's and UT. And I think that um, what this is gonna allow us to do is query samples from all of these individual sites and connect that with the genetic data from those individuals. The real benefit of this from my perspective is that it will allow folks who were really forgotten in the genetic revolution, particularly people of color, um, to participate as we identify more variants um, in folks of African American descent. It will also allow collaborations across the country. For example, when you reach out and you query an item and you say, hey, you know, my colleague at Harvard is studying this, it will provide a natural bridge for collaborations, grants, and big science, which is what we're all trying to achieve. We also have a program that's been in place for many years, but that I would like to see used more called Kindle. And the College of Medicine is going to begin providing financial support um, for the director of Kindle with the understanding that it will be used more on this campus, uh, in addition to nationally to support both local and national research projects as well as integrate with the big initiative. So a lot of work there. Candle's really a, an incredibly neat study um, and we can present that at a later date, but it really looks at um, triads, mom and baby and dad over long periods of time looking at cognition of these children. And there's genetic data, there's blood, there's a variety of different tissue samples that can be investigated as well as phenome data. My understanding is that it started as a study about school preparedness to try and make sure kids were getting ready for school, but now it's morphed into so much more. And it's really another rich database that we have at UT that we can use for collaborative science. We've also developed our program in cancer. And, and in addition to being a clinical program, this has a very, very strong research arm to it. The program in cancer is leadership is shown below. Um, we now have tumor boards in all of the areas that we've shown and they're UT run tumor boards. Pretty amazing when you consider that we started off with none. Um, but what I wanted to talk about in this segment was the research component of the program in cancer. This year, for the first time, we had a research retreat in cancer with, I believe, well over 100 people attending. We had seminars, we had poster presentation, and it really highlighted the tremendous work in cancer going on at UT. The difference is now we have a structure on which to base that work. It's not disparate parts. We have a foundation on which we can build. So part of our platform is to actually build upon that very, very viable foundation. All of this is galvanized together by the research strategic plan um, within the College of Medicine. And so many of you participated in that strategic plan. I wanna thank Dr. Griffith for his leadership. But really the cost cutting themes of this are, are ones that should be obvious to us all. Sustainability, excellence, diversity, mentoring, and to promote people who are in our programs as well as those are outside of our programs. And I'm delighted that just recently we were able to award um, Dr. Adi Adibye the um, Eldon D. and Ruth Cornell Professorship for his excellence in research. We're gonna be starting a new tradition in the College of Medicine. We wanna celebrate one another upon great achievements. We don't celebrate each other enough. So we're actually gonna start having investiture ceremonies for chairs um, when they become invested. And um, in the near future, you will be receiving, uh, I hope will be our first public investiture ceremony so that we can celebrate one another and we can take pride in one another's accomplishments and enjoy in what the College of Medicine does. Education. Um, this is Dr. Rodney Taylor giving our white coat address last year, a very special time. We were awarded full LCME accreditation for an indeterminate term. 
we were pleased that we were awarded full accreditation, but the indeterminate term means we have work to do. I met with all of you via a town hall where I went through in great detail each of the citations and I laid out the possibilities for improvement. I'm not gonna go through all of those today. What I would like to emphasize is three collaborative opportunities. The first is student mistreatment. Student mistreatment has no place on our campus. Mistreatment of anybody has no place on our campus. For those of you who know me know that I tend to be a pretty jovial fella, joke around a lot. I don't joke about student mistreatment or mistreatment of others. It simply will not be tolerated. So I would encourage each of you every single day to set an example for who our young physicians want to be. You know, we talk about culture and, and sometimes people say, Dr. Strom, our culture is this and our culture is that. And my response to them is to go and look in the mirror and you are a culture. If you have a smile on your face and you're supportive of other people and you lift them up when they're down, that's our culture. If you walk around with a frown or you're yelling at people or you're um, doing not the right thing, that's our culture. You are our culture. So make it what we want it to be. Timely submissions of grades. We have to get grades in within six weeks. I'm pleased to report that um, since my little memo, that hasn't been a problem. And um, formative feedback. Formative feedback, we do all the time. Formative feedback is essentially iterative teaching. Student does something, you show them the proper way to do it and then they get to do it again. Um, summative feedback simply means a grade. It's the end of the course evaluation. But I'd encourage you to play a little game with the students say, I'm providing formative feedback now. And the student acknowledges I'm receiving formative feedback now. It sounds a little bit crazy, but that's where we need to go because unfortunately, sometimes our students don't know when they're receiving formative feedback. And candidly, sometimes our faculty don't know where they're giving it. So it's so important to our accreditation. So if folks would just think about this. I would be remiss if I did not call out two incredible leaders, um, and there were so many more, but Dr. White, Mike Witt really led this effort, and Dr. Derek Wilcox um, was the a lead computer analyst uh, who supported this effort. Both have been absolutely terrific. And I owe them both a debt of gratitude. So who are we? Well, this is what our class looks like. Um, you can see, as I mentioned, that we have 50% females and 50% males. Um, we accept, uh, the folks who we accept have an average GPA of 3.89, 3.89, holy smokes, and a science GPA of 3.80. You can see where our MCAT scores are, but they're above the national average. And we accept folks from about 73 different colleges and medical schools all across uh, the state and the country. We have a diverse student population, but I'd like to see that diversity improve. So that's where they start. Where do they finish? Well. Dr. Witt stole a little bit of my thunder, uh, but we had an incredible match this year. Thanks so much to Dr. Katherine Womack, who really led all of the efforts on helping our students, um, helping our students match. I literally could not imagine a better sure. dean of students who takes everything personally and treats all of the students uh, like her own. Just absolutely incredible, the level of care and compassion that our students get. So we've talked about where they come from, we talked about where they go, but what about the stuff in the middle? So we want them to have a great experience. So under the leadership of Dr. Uh, Dennis Ferretia, Dr. Nia Zalamea, and Dr. Alston Dago, we created a Center for Multicultural and Global Health. And the idea for multicultural and global health was that we have problems right here in Memphis. So we can't just do global health and ignore the problems we have at home. We move forward with our 
and built what we call the Schoenberg Scholarship, secondary to a generous donation by the Schoenberg family. And this year, we had two scholars go to Israel and um, in partnership with the University of the Negev, they just returned and it was a cultural exchange where they learn how to take care for the Bedouin community. Their students this year will be coming to UT for a similar exchange. Um, so we're gonna learn from one another and grow. More to come. We've also worked very, very hard on student debt and we've created a multi-pronged program to reduce student debt, really under the leadership of Dr. Hartnett and our board of visitors. And I'm so pleased that with this program, for the last two years, our student debt has plummeted. And for the past two years, our student debt is below the national average, something that we should all be proud of. I also wanna thank the campus and President Boyd and his team for this, because one of the ways we were able to reduce student debt is by keeping our tuition, in-state tuition stable and reducing our out-of-state tuition while everybody else's was going up. And that's really the power of partnership. So we owe them a debt of gratitude. Under the leadership of Dr. Tina Mullick, we built a three-year MD program so that our students have access to innovative programming. What an incredible thing uh, for folks seeking to go into primary care. This does a lot of things, all of which are positive. It reduces student debt by eliminating one year of the curriculum. It brings the best students to UT by novel programming. And it serves the needs of the state by creating primary care physicians. Last year, this year was our start. We're already enrolling for next year and the program is growing. So we're off to really a terrific start. As many of you know, the physician's assistance program is in the College of Medicine. And with the change in paradigms of medical practice, I think that's both appropriate and important. We're lucky to have Dr. Stephanie Storgian lead our physician's assistant program. We have about 30 uh, students accepted into the program each semester, a total of 60. And you can see what they look like, a very, very competitive group. And they get jobs all over the state. So really an amazing program and something that we can all take an incredible amount of pride in our physician's assistants. As many of you know, this year we had an unexpected event where we went on um, GME institutional probationary accreditation. We've responded uh, dynamically under the incredible leadership of Natasha Thompson and, and Aaron Haynes. And we have received our date where they're gonna come back and, and optimistically, and indeed I'm confident, restore accreditation. Even with that, we've had an incredible experience. So 98% of our programs filled in the main residency match. 61% of our medicine residents are remaining in the UT system for fellowship. And what that means is that they were very satisfied um, for, with their training experience. And then using a similar statistic, about 50% of our pediatric residents are remaining in the UT system for fellowship. So why? These data are literally hot off the press. We got them yesterday. And um, a real credit to Erica. But what they show in the yellow bar is the national average. And what they show in blue is UT. And when you look, and it's difficult to read, what they're looking at is resources, professionalism, patient safety, faculty teaching, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. What you see is that in all instances, UT is at or above the national average, at or above the national average. That's incredible. Um, something that we can all take a tremendous amount of pride in. Our students wanna stay here. They're satisfied or very satisfied with the residency programs and the vast, vast majority would make the choice to come back. That says a lot. Last topic I wanna to talk on is community outreach. And, and 
I want to say that we couldn't do community outreach without our board of visitors and really our leader, Dr. Mr. Jim Shaheen, who's just spent tireless hours um, helping us. We have two seminal projects. Uh, the first is the Fraser Community Garden. This garden arose out of the idea that health starts with healthy fruits and vegetables. Um, each of these efforts have been pioneered and led uh, by one of our terrific Board of Visitors. And Mr. Nathan Lubin has led this effort. He let me drive his tractor, um, which was pretty scary for me and the tractor. Um, yeah, I, he also tried to let me drive his horse and uh, that's not a good idea because me and the horse had a problem. Well, I didn't have a problem with the horse. The horse had a problem with me. Um, but we ended up uh, planting last fall our first um, uh, greens. We planted collard plants and um, uh, a lot of other kinds of plants. And then we had a greens cook-off. And, um, you know, the building where the greens cook-off um, took place was austere, to say the least. But there was so much happiness in that building uh, when that event was occurring. I've never been in anything like it. And this year when we have our Greens Kirk off, I would encourage you all to come. It's really incredibly special. Plus, you'll never ever have cornbread like that in your entire life. We've also worked very hard to build a health hub. And this is based on the notion that every single person deserves someone who cares about them. It's a really simple thing. Every person deserves somebody who cares about them. Um, and in order to do that, we partnered with Henry Turley, who gave us the space and allowed us to build a health hub. And this health hub initially was designed to screen for obesity, diabetes, and hypertension but we've learned a lot. And what we've learned is that, um, what we've learned is that people don't come in labeled with diabetes, obesity, and hypertension. They come in saying, my child may be involved with gang violence. They come in saying, I have depression. They come in with a variety of different ailments. The Health Hub is designed to give an equitable way to introduce people into medicine to get people who don't have access, access. That's what the Health Hub is there for. And it's gotten so much interest. We were just mating yesterday with um, some significant uh, community leaders, I'll, I'll say that, um, to partner who wanna grow the Health Hubs throughout the city. So I think this is a growing concept and I think it could be something that is scalable and in partnership with other communities, we could really move towards taking care of those who aren't as fortunate. In both of these concepts, I would be remiss if I didn't thank two people. One are the Dean of Community Health and Engagement, Dr. Alpha Stewart. And the second is Dr. Jim Bailey, both of whom have been instrumental in leading these efforts. As I mentioned at the outset, we are a statewide campus. We're privileged to have Dr. Paul Hopman leading our Knoxville efforts. And my, um, my dedication of only one slide to Knoxville in no way means that we don't care about Knoxville. What it means is that Dr. Hopman, which very appropriate, has his own state of the College of Medicine address. So many of the items were covered there and I'll simply summarize them here. They've created new educational programs, such as a new master's degree. They've created a new leadership academy. They have growth in research and growth in clinical programs. And um, we're looking forward very much, hopefully, to creating an inaugural um, uh, governor's chair uh, with the Knoxville campus and Oak Ridge National Laboratories. Like Knoxville, uh, we're very privileged to have Dr. James Haynes serving as the interim dean of the Chattanooga campus. And they've just done a great job. So we actually, we're so big, we have three ACGME programs. And under Dr. Haynes' leadership, the ACGME program in uh, Chattanooga has zero institutional citations um, against it. And they're, they're very large as well. And I think the goal here to show you is just 
the entire state together is one functioning unit where we educate about 1,500, 1,500 residents and fellows. And I don't think people know that. So real thanks to both of those. Uh, I also want to thank them for growing their research presence as well as their community outreach presence. We rely on um, our future. And these are some of the many faces that will be joining us or have joined us this past year. We have recruited 159 faculty. Think about that for a second. That's a lot of people who came into UT. 159 faculty uh, since the last State of the College of Medicine address. So please join me in welcoming all those new individuals when you see them and make them feel at home at UT. So what are we trying to do for the upcoming year? Where are our administrative goals? As I mentioned, we're gonna to continue to promote diversity, equity, and inclusion. We're gonna be initiating a strategic planning process for the College of Medicine this fall. We've already built the research strategic plan, but now I think um, things are stable enough that we're poised to build the clinical strategic plan, the plan for education, and the plan for community outreach. We're continuing to advance our clinical partnerships and under Dr. Buckley's leadership, we have a team in place to take stock of where we are and help guide where we're going, which I think is very appropriate. We're gonna address the concerns of the LCME in collaboration with campus. We plan to restore full ACGME accreditation at one of our three um, campuses. We're gonna to continue to foster research growth through the creation of campus-wide strategic platforms. Community health and engagement is who we are. If we simply look inside the College of Medicine and not outside, we've automatically failed. We're gonna expand our board of visitors to reflect more of who we wanna be as part of our aspirational goals. And in order to drive these missions, we're gonna rededicate ourselves to philanthropic approaches, particularly now that we can travel. TJ Patel showed me a great talk that he gave and I loved it and it was all focused on Ted Lasso. So I am gonna leave you with uh, summary lessons from Ted Lasso, I'm not gonna read them, uh, but you get to read them on your own time. And, and I think they say perhaps better than I could, uh, thank you. Um, Thank you and thank you. I feel very privileged to have been able to give this talk to you and I'm happy to entertain any questions. Does anybody have any questions and you can feel free in the chat. All right, great. Well, I really appreciate everybody coming um, and I look forward to another fantastic year in the college.